All right, good afternoon, everyone. So we're gonna proceed forward with our Q&A session. All right, so we have uh, Jordan Hankins, uh, Robert Schroeder, Dr. Stovall, Dr. Lynn. You've in, uh, engaged in conversations with our keynote speakers and community-engaged scholars throughout the day. Now is your opportunity to ask any questions, any best practices, anything at all that will help you be, uh, to help yourselves be better educators, to support communities of color and our students. Cool, so let's kick it off. Yes, and we have a microphone coming around. Yes, uh, Borna has the mic. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm a SPED teacher, as I think I told all of you. Uh, so my question is, I have very young kids in my class, they're kindergartners and first graders, and self-advocacy is already really important in special ed because it's something they need to learn as like a baseline for themselves, but also students of color have to be able to self-advocate on an even greater level. So what is something, this is for all of you, um, what do you think you would say or do with children that are that young to teach them the value of self-advocacy? I think one of the things that's critically important in that space is tools to be able to alert folks on when there is a concern, right? So if whatever, <clears throat> whatever the strategy is to alert, fo to alert people that there is a concern, but also having them be able to recognize who are the folks there who are serving as a resource, who have, who have demonstrated that they can be trusted or can be, can, has, have demonstrated that they can be used as a resource, right? Because when you talk about young folks of color, particularly who may be differently abled, uh, differently learned, a lot of times the, defi the deficit narrative runs so high that they are not believed, right? So now it has to be a process where, and you have, to, you have to practice this with them, right? In terms of if there is a concern, now what do we do, right? Who do we now start to engage? What are the particular practices, especially with little ones, right? Because in spaces where they are often deeply isolated, depending on what, what the school situation is, they may not have avenues by which to advocate for themselves. So now you have to practice that with them in terms of how they will advocate for themselves if an issue or concern arises. I, I think it, it's, I agree with that. And I think it's also about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my own kids, right, uh, when they were young and um, giving them permission to say no, to say I don't like something, um, um, and, and being okay with that as the authority figure. A lot of times when a child refused to, does, to do something, refuses to do something, we want to you know, be more assertive and put that pressure on, say, no, you have to do this. But uh, giving them permission to say no, uh, listening to them, and, let, and, and letting them sort of explain why they feel the way they do about a certain thing. So they're getting in touch with their feelings, taking ownership of their feelings, um, and you know, being able to make choices is very, very important. And a lot of times we take away uh, freedom of choice from, from kids um, because, again, we want them to do what we want them to do, right? But giving them that ownership, giving them that independence and that autonomy of, 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 of spirit and you know, being, being a little free to think for themselves is really important. Um, and the other thing I think uh, around self-advocacy, I'm thinking back to my own classroom experience, is that um, when something happens, uh, something goes down, maybe there's a conflict or between two kids or maybe there was a conflict with another adult is it giving them the opportunity to explain you know, what happened from their perspective and valuing that and listening to that, right? And so you teach them that if you 
you know, offer your perspective on this, people will listen and it matters and it, and it, and it will influence the outcome of the situation if you, um, you know, uh, speak from your, with your own voice from your own perspective. So I, I think that's really important in, um, in terms of just that early identity. And I think, you know, um, the, the identity formation. And so any issue that comes up, I think you can um, draw on those skills. And then I'm gonna piggyback off of that because uh, like like you were saying, like me dealing with kids, it's like I always tell them to be a leader. You, um, I say your voice matters and you can be a leader. And they say, well, why we wanna be a leader? I said, okay, so you're following me, Mr. Strata, right? Yes. I said, I'm jumping off the mountain and killing myself. What do that mean? I said, if you're following me, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I try to tell them it's important that they become leaders. America, we need leaders in America. We don't need followers. And if you follow people, most people that follow people get in trouble and, and have them voice their opinion and just let them know how important it is for them to be a leader and lead their own destiny and um, have a voice. All right. Uh, yes, thank you for sharing those insights. We have two questions in the middle. Um, I just wanted to add to what you guys were already talking about with self-advocacy and mm -hmm. having your students be leaders. And so I teach at the high school level, and I've already had some experiences, kids coming up to me saying, Miss, I don't like school. I don't want to go to college. And I've always told them so far, tell me if I'm wrong, but my approach to this question always been, that's fine. I tell them school is not for everyone, especially the way it's set up here, it's not for everyone. But I, tell, I always ask them, but what you gonna do? Mm -hmm. You can't walk out of this school building with no plan. Mm -hmm. and I always tell them, school is not for everyone, I get that, but you need to have a plan for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I always tell them, well, what you wanna do? Then they start getting all blank. Well, I don't know, I just don't like school. And I'm like, well, that's not a problem. Because you can't go through life, no plan. You can, you know, you don't have to have a perfect plan. Right. And of course, things can go astray. But you need to have some kind of idea of what you're going to get yourself right. into. Yeah. And so that's something I always try to advocate for my students. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It wasn't really a question. Though. I just wanted to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, if I could turn it into a question, would you take the same approach yeah. into that a student approach, I don't like school. But then it starts to get into the conversation of, well, I don't want to do school now. If I'm not going to do it later, why would I do it now? And so that's usually the problem I end up getting into. They don't want to do work, uh, school, excuse me, later. So they don't, they don't see the value in doing school now with me right. while they still need to legally. Right, right. So what would be your approach be to that? There is a video that's really heavy. You can get it on Netflix last, uh, now. It's uh, by Nas, and it's called Time is Illmatic. And his father is a jazz musician named Olu Dara. Olu Dara has, it's about a three minute clip. It is one of the most striking things I have ever heard about school. Olu Dara, so Nas has a, for people who don't know who Nasir Jones is, Nas, Nasir Jones is a very famous uh, MC rapper. Nas has a brother whose nickname is Jungle. So Olu Dara talks about how he sat Nas and Jungle down when they were both in ninth grade. And he said, look, I come from Jim Crow schools in the South. There was nothing happening in those places. Now, if you leave this place called school, there is no question that you have to figure out what it is that you're going to do. I will not accept you not having a plan. And he, when he said that, and it go, the, the film goes back to Nas, and Nas said, when, my father, when I had that conversation with my father, I left school never to return. And to me, you know, as educators, everybody's looking like, well, what? why are you showing this? I'm like, man, look, this is what we have to contend with. We got to ask a deeper question of what it is that we're in, right? And if it is not working, what are we willing to do to support folks because this thing is not working? But you're exactly right in terms of how you say it. Like, look, 
You have, the, the piece is, if this ain't working, then you gotta have a plan. So if you're gonna build that plan, you might as well build it here, right? So this thing around really, because that's, that's the thing about being so direct, like this will not work. If you leave and you do not have a plan, you are in the worst situation, right? Nas had a plan that was extreme in some senses, but a plan nonetheless, right? I mean, he talked about, Nas talked about how when he left school, the first thing he did was to memorize a rhyming dictionary. It's like, wow, how hard that is, <laughs> right? So Nas is deeply intelligent, but his father saw that they were already disconnecting from school. And he said, look, if this is what's gonna happen, you gotta have, you gotta have a plan, right? It will not work if you don't have a plan from this space. But I think as educators, that's when we make the separation between schooling and education, right? And what we're really talking about is schooling in that instance, right? Because they're not, in, they're not engaged, they're not um, activated. So now we have to figure out strategies by which to engage them for the purpose of developing that plan, right? And to, and to be that intentional about it. But you, know, you are absolutely right. And then I'm gonna piggyback on that. The reason I created a hip hop entrepreneurship program was I addressed students like that. And I said, well, that's cool, but you can be an entrepreneur. Um, you might wanna do a vocational training. You wanna be a welder. You might wanna be an artist. You might wanna, you know, whatever you like to do, let's plan for you to do that. And they said, oh, I don't wanna do that. I wanna hustle. And I said, what, you wanna hustle? I said, yeah, you want to hustle? Well, you know what you're going to do? I'm going to tell you from not what I read in the book, not no numbers. I'm going to tell you about what I've been through and what my homies been through. Mm -hmm. Where you're going to be going is jail or dead. Those are the two options you have. And then you'll be lucky if you go to jail. Mm -hmm. So if you choose to hustle, that's what's going to happen. And if you choose not to go to school, what about when you're 65 and working at McDonald's? 65 working at McDonald's, I ain't doing that. Well, when you, when you can't read your application, because you barely can read, right? You have to read and write to fill out your application. You have to apply those skills. So that's why you need school and education. Not saying it's everything, it might not be for you. So you get, uh, at least get your diploma so you can get a regular job at the worst and be an entrepreneur and uh, learn how to be a businessman, fill out applications, do what you have to do to survive. And that's basically how I go about letting the kid know every school isn't for everyone. You could be an entrepreneur and you can be great being an entrepreneur. See, I'm always good at, um, well, I'll say I'm bad at it. I'm always bad at pushing, well, in the past, pushing students to be, well, to go to college, take that college route, right? But again, like everyone has mentioned, and you mentioned, it's not for everyone, right? So that's how do I transform this experience for this student while they're in this classroom um, with me, right? When we're here what, for this hour together at the, at the most. Um, and like um, you were just saying that you need these basic skills within this classroom to use them outside of, you know, outside of the classroom, right? So no matter what you decide to do, whether that not be college or not, if it is the hustle, you still need to know how to do math. And not saying that we need to, you know, not to say that we need to encourage students to go and hustle, but you know, you know what I mean? But just encourage them to do the best that they can and transform whatever it is that they want to do while they're there in your classroom, right? And support that vision and those goals. So. Well, you know, I, I would say, what, what are the forces that are driving that student out. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's the call of the hustle or whatever it is, but there's obviously something going on in that setting that is not amenable to who they are, right? And that doesn't speak to them. And so part of what I try to think about is, well, how do you remake school so that it is suitable for that student, right? Um, you know, I mean, you, you don't want to encourage people to, to go out and sell illegal things, but at the same time, there are skills, as you were saying, associated with that. Right? And there are other types of experiences that you can have. You can sell other things, right? You could sell cars, right? And, it, and it's this similar skill set is involved, right? And so you can emphasize you know, um, certain uh, skills uh, that may be connected to something they want to do that may not be legal, that may end up, as you were saying, getting them you know, either prison time or, or jail. Uh, but there are, there are other types of experiences that they can have 
um, that I think we can prepare them for in school. I think we can also, I think we need to find a way to make school a place where uh, kids on the margin feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I think yes. that's what I was trying to sort of communicate when I, when I was talking about the, the culturally sustaining pedagogy, right? So why does it have to look and feel a certain way? Because that's historically how it's always looked and felt. Well, what, what if we ask the kids, you know, how, how, should we, how could we design this classroom so that it fits your needs better? What do you think he would say? My kids? Yeah. You are good. Well, no homework. I don't want that. Okay. He would probably ask for support in things outside of school. Mm -hmm. Things that he can apply to his own life that would be beneficial. Because, yep. you know, they always come like, why well, do I don't need to know Pythagorean theorem? I'm not going right. to use that in the yeah. real world. Yep. But then I would have to transform that into something he can see. Right. 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 So connecting the curriculum to that student's life, yeah. right? And understanding what's going on in his or her life so that you can do that. So you got to be kind of an anthropologist as an educator to, be, to better understand what, what, what are the issues? What are the things that are, that are potentially driving this student away? And how do I you know, exclude those things that are going to be unattractive? And how do I include those things that are going to, get a, going to uh, deeply connect? I think you're, what you're talking about with the Pythag Pythagorean theorem and, and, and connecting that to real life, um, even, you know, my kids uh, are, are in a very different situation, right, you know, and with, with, with parents who, you know, have resources. But they, too, want to know how this stuff applies, right, to their lives. And, and they get turned off sometimes in math classes that where stuff is just completely abstract and, and there's no real understanding of how this connects. So I think really deepening that personal connection for students, understanding who, who they are, what their experiences are, what their likes and dis dislikes are, and incorporating that into the classroom experience. And I think as teachers, I saw a teacher um, in some research I did advocate for that kind of change school-wide. Um, and uh, you know, there was a policy committee that he <coughs> sat on where we were talking about, well, well how can we uh, reshape curriculum to really fit the needs and experiences of our students to, to generate greater interest so that they, they hopefully don't feel like they want to leave. I also love this idea, you know, I think what you were hinting at was like the apprenticeship, um, you know, the, connecting them to some kind of industry or some kind of business or, or something outside that, that um, is, is connected to their school experience or to their learning something practical that they can do. Uh, you, you know, while they are learning some skills in school and we're connecting those things, right? So you're learning these skills today so you can go to over here tomorrow and do that. And they see a, 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 a connection between what they're learning in the classroom and what they have to do to, in order to, to, make a, to, to make a living, for example. Thank you for those insights. All right, do you have a question? Um, so mine isn't really a question either. It's for Dr. Sobel. Um You talked about your I think it was a friend from Brazil that made that point where the way first grade, second grade, that's not how the brain works. And I know you guys have different conversations in every breakout session. I just wanted that to like for the room for everybody to hear that because that like blew my mind. So there um, in Chicago, I work with uh, two folks who do work internationally around critical perspectives in education. So one is Pauline Lippmann and the other one is a one of the homies named Rico Gutstein. And they, one year they brought a guy to Chicago named Ivan de Martin Martins. He's from a place called Porto Alegre, Brazil. And in Porto Alegre, Brazil, they have citizenship schools. So we took him on a tour of schools in Chicago. And he, he kept looking and he came back to us and he said, man, he said, man, I'm deeply confused by this. He said, what is this first, second, third, fourth grade? <laughs> exactly. He was like, do you he was like, do you all know that the brain doesn't work like that? Right. And he said that like you all you all have created an arbitrary system that has a series of assessments that determine that they go on to the next set of assessments. Like there's there's no he was like, there's no learning in this. Right? He said, and I'm looking and he kept looking in the window. He kept looking in the window and just saying, and he just kept doing this. He was first, second, third. He was like, the brain actually, we know that the brain operates from its capacity to connect 
first. Right? So the brain, the brain is operating in terms of what it actually connects with. And then based on the connection, then it actually engages in a developmental process from pulling out what is already in the brain. So when we talk about this, you know, we talk about this kind of developmental, we always talk about this thing developmentally, but we never acknowledge what is already in the brain. And he says this first, second, third, fourth grade, that has nothing to do with how we know how the brain works. He was like, that is an arbitrary, that is an arbitrary development that you all figured out how to test folks. And then as he was talking about it, other people said, well, wow, that's another way to understand how capitalism works because they've monetized that, right? So Pearson got all these contracts with Nevada and they got them in Illinois, they got them in Minnesota for tens of millions of dollars for decades. You know, some of these contracts are 100 years long, right? So this thing around looking at that really took and asking again, back to the earlier point, this question around school, right? And I'm, again, making the distinction between education and school, school being this order and compliance that we fool ourselves into believing is learning. And it's not, just based on the way the thing is structured. Right, here's a dude who comes from Brazil and says, y'all know the brain doesn't work like that? <laughs> what are y'all doing? <laughs> right? And, and now, and then the other thing he asked, and I didn't say in the group, he was like, and why do y'all believe that? Right. <laughs> he was like, what, what's, he was like what's wrong with y'all? <laughs> like, he, he, he was like, man, I am deeply confused by this. Right? I'm just looking at something that is completely arbitrary to how we know learning functions. So it's, a, um, it's always a conundrum, but again, pushing us to ask questions of our condition. So now we can make a decision to either reject that or do something entirely different, right? Which would not necessarily be schooling as much as it would be uh, education. I would just say this real quick. Um, you know, you talked about Marxism and a kind of a Marxist analysis of schooling, which, which looks at the, you know, the political economy of schooling. And, 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 and but we can also look at uh, schooling as a white supremacist project, mm -hmm. right? And white supremacy and racism is about categorizing and separating and dividing people mm -hmm. based on what? Mm -hmm. Race, Race, right? And so in school, we divide people based on intelligence, based on age, and all these kinds. So that this, these all these principles of division, of separation, right, um, are are threaded throughout all of our institutions, um, and and it really is. Uh, based on a, a kind of white supremacist project, which which came out of you know the the the, the European Enlightenment and all of that, right? So, um, I, so that, but that's where we are, uh, and I, and I, and, and I, don't, I don't know that as teachers, you know, you're going to have the power to sh shift that, and that's why I keep going back to, who are your students, you know? How do you get? How do you engage them? How do you get to know? How do you make? their lives, you know, the text upon which you center, right, your instruction and, and your thinking. And how are you reflecting on who you are, right, what your biases are, what, what your, um, you know, deficit thing, because we all have deficit notions about the other um, that we learn from our parents, right? You know, I, I'm not going to tell you some of the things my mother says about other people, and I have to say, hey, ma, <laughs> right, so we all have that. Uh, and how do we confront those belief systems uh, in, in, in order to be able to work with kids who are different from us um, and so on. So I mean, I, I think that's what it goes back to because schooling as a structure needs to be remade. Um, but, but I think that's a broader social, political, economic movement that we can engage in, quite frankly, with politicians, right? And, and I do that work too. Um, but I think the, class, the classroom teacher role uh, you probably are fairly resigned to accept the structure as it is, but then to think about the student as being at the center of that, right? Because I think you can do powerful things when you understand that the student is always at the center of teaching and learning. Just to extend upon that, um, we know that our educational system is, particularly for students of color, is heavily uh, skewed towards this deficit modeling. Right approach, but as educators, how can we flip that to a, to a more asset-based support system? So going from that negative support to that positive support to support those students. There's a, there's a very basic question that comes up, and 
I, the, all the stuff that I'm saying to you all today, you know, this is stuff that I'm asking of myself, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm also, 30 years in, I'm still trying to figure this thing out, right? The question I'm always trying to ask is, can education happen in these places that we call schools, mm -hmm. right? And if it is, what determines that, right? And now when you think about supporting young folks, if you, if you change the logic to center on the student, now you can do your work differently, right? And I'm always thinking about our work as a reference point. So if someone is seeing how you do your work and the affect that you're having with your students, there's the greater chance that they will ask you how you're doing what it is that you're doing, right? So now when they ask you, now you have to be willing to share with them what it is that you're doing, right? And unfortunately, we see this kind of bastardized. There's a story of a woman named Harriet Bell and these two white dudes from a who started a school called Knowledge is Power Program, KIPP, mm. stole her teaching practices and misinterpreted them. And it's a story that's never told. And because it's not told, we often think that all of this stuff kind of comes ready-made, but it's, it doesn't. And because it doesn't, we have to now figure out what are the ways to support folks given, and let's, let's talk about it what it is, right? How do we support folks in a hostile and violent situation right. like traditional schools? Right. Let's, let's get away from the, the nice conversation, right? How do we support folks in a hostile and violent situation, right? And I'm not talking about young people on young people violence, right? I'm talking about the vertical violence of schools. Right? That is violence being waged on people. Right? And now, when you think about that violence being waged, now how do you invert a practice that centers in who they are, their contributions, and their capacity to be humanized in a space with each other? Because when you're humanizing them, you are also humanizing yourself. So, but again, we can't run from this stuff, y'all. I mean, that's, I think that's the thing when we talk about school spaces, right? These are hostile and violent spaces. These are spaces ensconced in white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? And a deficit nature on young people of color. So now, given that's what we know, how do we move in that space, right? And how are we intentional about how we move in that space? Yeah, that's, and I want to, like me being in, uh, you know, in middle school, I go through that a lot where teachers, offer, I think it's MBIs or MBIs, when they, they, they're they more like it's policing, like writing you tickets to where all of the students, I have teachers, well, I did 10 MBIs today and I did this. And I'm like, all I did was probably one the whole year, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, wow, you, well, they came tardy. They was a second late and I did this. And then the teachers come, I mean, the students come to me, man, Mr. Strader, they prejudice, they this. That why is it school like jail? And I'm like, no, who who told a kid that? Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? They the, the kids are living just like you said. They're living in this school where they're getting over policed, and then they feel a certain type of way, and they're not learning nothing in education because they worried about the rules. Yep. We have so many rules. We got rules on top of rules on top of rules. And I just be, I be like, yeah, the rules got rules. You said it right. The rules got rules. And I'm like, and I'm a, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. And then I'm like, the te they come and tell me. And then the teachers always come to me. Well, what do you say to the students? Because students work in my class because I let them be their self. And we sit around and we talk about things. And then I said, well, let's get to work. And then if you sleep in my class, I come and I just say, and they wake up and I say, boo, you saw the boogeyman, huh? <laughs> no, you can't go to sleep in here. You have to, I don't know what you do in that other class, but in here, you got to pay attention because Mrs. Strader wants you to be more than me and my friends, and I want you to be something because you kids went through the worst uh, as any kids ever did in the United States history of kids. Mm -hmm. you, you went through the pandemic. You went through not going to school. You, you learned a new thing was virtual learning. And you just did all these things and everything was for adults. We got checks, we got this, we got that. And the only thing you guys had was more rules. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to start um, learning, you know, understanding. And like, I, that's why I love hip hop entrepreneurship. It gives these kids a voice to express themselves and make adults listen to them. And that's what, like what you were saying, Dr. Stavall, it's like we need to start listening to our kids and do less policing. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know. So I want to, I think that's a great perspective. And I want to <laughs> add to that. So I think that well, I, I have a unique perspective, right? Because I'm not directly in the classroom, but I work with educators on a daily basis, right? From all different schools in the Clark County School District. And from what I see is a lot of educators do take that deficit-based approach, mm -hmm. right? When working mm -hmm. with students, especially yep. with black students or students of color. Yep. Not all students of color are poor or in this, you know, are, are just so desolate and, you know, mm -hmm. and need all the support. While, while we do, in an instance, I feel like that's, that's something that educators have an issue with doing, right? It's like everyone, like they have to be the savior. And it's like, no, we need to work with our students as if they're as equal as we are, right? Or, you know, on that same playing field, yes. like we don't have to, like we can take that approach, an asset-based approach, right? Instead, mm -hmm. like, hey, no, I have such high aspirations for you. And remember what we talked about? I don't know if everyone remembers, but the three A's, right? Like offering that as advocacy and aspiration to our students instead of um, approaching them from that other lens to where, you know, poor, oh, woe is me for these students. Like, no, our students, and, and that's another thing I've noticed as well when working with educators is they have very low expectations mm -hmm. for students, especially yeah. black students, right? Um, and what does that tell the students? The students can feel that. They don't even need to tell them they have low expectations for them, right? So I think just going into that classroom saying, no, I have high expectations for every single one of you, and I'm not expecting anything less. And if you are giving less, then we'll work on those things together, right? And figure out what it is about your background or your, you know, your, your community, what's going on at home to, you know, to, to, um, to help you get up to the standard that I have for you, right? Or this, you know, or the standard for the rest of our students, so. Yeah. I'll just say real quickly to that yeah. question, um, you know, an asset is something that is of value. Mm -hmm. And so to look at every student as possessing assets, right, that, 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 everything, that they have these valuable tools and skills that you need to tap into. You know, I grew up uh, poor in a poor community on the south side of Chicago. And when, and when I hear people talk about poor communities as being, you know, static and one dimensional, it, it upsets me because in my community, of, of poor people, we had religious diversity, we had Baptists, Jehovah Witnesses, Muslims, right, all on my block, right? We had um, people who worked full time, we had some who were on welfare, I mean, we had a, I mean, we had a variety of people from different circumstances, different, and all of us were African American, but we were diverse, right? And so I learned uh, as, as a poor kid growing up in the South Side of Chicago about uh, uh, how to respect religious diversity. I think the other thing, I mean, there are lots of other things that, that poor people learn, like you know, how, to, how to efficiently use resources, right? Um, so that you can make a dollar stretch. I mean, that is a skill, right? That, that is a skill that is highly valued in the banking industry, you know, to be able to, to efficiently use a dollar and stretch it, right, uh, and, and use it well. Um, and so there are lots of things that, that you, you know, uh, people possess in terms of assets and skills that uh, we may not see as such. And I think, um, again, that, that sort of dialogue and understanding you know, who they are and what they're bringing to the table is really important. And not bringing uh, a kind of a, a lens, that it, like a deficit lens to the table, uh, because what that does is that erases that person's humanity and, it, and it, it forecloses on your opportunity to really be able to be in relationship with them. And if you can't be in relationship with them, you can't teach them. Uh, thank you for those uh, insights. All right, questions from the audience. We've got one from a virtual watcher that yes. I'm going to ask. It's kind of along the same lines. Um, so she says, uh, Mackenzie Sully says, oftentimes we get suggestions such as incorporating literature or visuals that involve different races, gender, different backgrounds. Um, how do you do that in classes that aren't, you don't have literature to rely on in you know science classes math classes how do you celebrate people's backgrounds and you know stories in those types of classes spaces I can start with that, um, Mackenzie. Um, and I think that's a wonderful question. And I will say, um, we ha have to look at our historical context, right, of especially, I'll say of African folks, right, um, and look at 
where math started and how math, right. math is used today, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, right? And being able to transcend that and to be able to use that within the classroom. So you absolutely can use images of, um, and even in science as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, you can literally trace that all back to one's culture, right? Or how it's even, even if it wasn't originated in one's culture, but how they're using it now, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a great way to, um, to add in those cultural influences within the classroom to represent the student, will represent your students. I think the lie that we tell ourselves is that content areas or disciplines outside of English language arts and social studies cannot incorporate broader conversations of race, class, age, mm -hmm. gender, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. and disability. Right? I think that's the lie that we tell ourselves. And we have to be deeply intentional because it is going to take more work because what you're going to have to do is separate yourself from the baseline narrative of Western Europe, right? Because that's always centered as the baseline or the cradle of civilization, which is a lie, right? So now, if you're going to talk about Western Europe, you can't talk about Western Europe without talking about the theft, of the, the theft from the African, the theft from the East Asian, the theft from the indigenous populations, the theft of the India people from India, right? So now it's important for us to do that digger deeping, that d deeper digging. Uh, and I actually got a chance to work with a guy named Danny, Sol uh, Danny Morales Doyle, who's a chemistry teacher, but he's actually a chemist. And he does this whole unit on morphine and heroin. Hmm. And what he talks about is indigenous pain relief that was non-addictive. And then Bristol Myers Scribb, the German company that gives us bare aspirin, actually takes that science and actually before they created aspirin, they were the producers of morphine, mm -hmm. right? So now, you know, when you think about, people don't think about this as much, but you used to be able to get morphine and heroin at Walgreens, right? It was just, it was, it was a regular understanding. So now when we start to talk about this, what he did is now think about, well, what were indigenous practices around pain relief and wellness, right? And now, how have those practices been taken away from their original intent, right? So again, we got to dig deeper to uncover those stories and those connections. Because when we don't make those connections, we just keep on submitting to this lie of Western Europe, Western Europe as the basis of all things when we know that that's part of the larger colonial project to get us to think that Western Europe is the basis of all things. Learned Western European people even tell you that it's a lie, right? right? So this thing around really being intentional about that, but also being able to go deeper in our work around how do we connect our content area to the lives of our students. Yeah, communities of color have made vast contributions to all the disciplines, but a lot of that knowledge and history has been covered up. Yes. And, it, and it does take some effort to, to find it. Um, and I talked about ethno-mathematics earlier, and that's where there's this effort to explore, like what is the role of Africans and indigenous people in the development of mathematics, right? Uh, the other thing I think is really important is something I didn't bring up, and I'm sorry to put it, to enter an, another term, because I know all these different terms and concepts are, are d challenging, but they're all around one idea, and that's around the student, right? But this idea of place-based instruction, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there's a, 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 science, a, a science teacher educator who was uh, on my faculty when I was dean at IU, who was just taking kids out into the neighborhood and let's, let's explore the environment, right? Uh, and let's see what's around us and let's use it as, as a tool to study and examine. Uh, and so they would, they would get things from the neighborhood and look at them under the microscope and they would learn about you know, molecules and all other types of things that they need to learn through the things that they found in their own environment. And so that's another, I think, important approach that, that's also, I think, consistent with what Dr. Stovall is talking about in terms of recognizing the contributions that, that we have all made to these disciplines, um, is that really using the community uh, as, as a space to explore. The other thing, too, is I think Dr. Stovall was, was hinting at this, is that 
you know, the disciplines were made for a specific reason. And I'll go back to what I was talking about in terms of the white supremacist project of, of sort of separating knowledge out, attributing knowledge to one group of people and so on. Um, we can think also more interdisciplinarily, uh, right, in terms of how all of these things are connected. And quite frankly, students, particularly uh, older students, high school students, are much more interested in uh, um, ideas that could be driven by several different subject um, areas, right, and, and connect it. So you can connect science to theater right? or, and, and, and to literacy, right? And so all of these things can be connected, but it's really about what problem are we trying to solve, right? Um, how are we trying to improve our communities, our neighborhoods? Um, how are we gonna be able to use this knowledge in some other way? So I think don't, don't be constrained by the discipline because I think you have opportunities to pursue things in a much more interdisciplinary way. All right, thank you for those. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, Borna, we have a question over here. Hi, um, I just wanna shift gears a little bit back more towards us as educators, and I just wanna ask your opinion. When you're dealing with topics um, with, that regard critical race theory and you're using history from your students' perspectives, from a cultural background, mm -hmm. when you're faced with um, administrators and parents and they're ob objecting against what you're teaching, what are some effective ways, aside from connecting it to standards and critical thinking that we can use as educators when faced with that? Yeah, I think one of the things that's critically important you are always putting the idea that you are addressing young people's curiosities and inquiries, right? And this is where the inquiry took us. And if they come at you, and remember, what Dr. Lynn put forward, remember, critical race theory is the straw person, right? That's not really what the fight is against, right? It's really around critical inquiry, right? The fight is young, the fight is against young people asking questions that adults fear that they don't know the answers to, right? So now, when you think about that, one of the strategies becomes, I am supporting the, I'm supporting the inquiry of young people to engage their world. These are the questions that have arisen in their world. This is, and I actually understand that in these spaces, the stories of many of my students have been purposefully excluded, erased, and removed. So now, in bringing those stories back into the fold, here's what we're discussing, right? And I think that's the thing, and it's and always connected back to the learning, right? The conversation is always around learning, right? It's always around we can't learn if we don't ask questions, right? And I think those things, right, because it's, it's harder for them to stump you when you're talking about the practices that you engage to support learning. Right. Right, that, because that, they can't really, they can't stump you on that because they, they're saying, you know, we were saying in one of the groups like, what's wrong with you, right? Your students are engaged. Right? They, they, they just won't do that, right? But this thing around really putting the conversation back around, we have to be clear. And the thing is, always, this is where factual evidence is important, right. not your conjecture, right? right? You can say, look, it is very clear and evident that the stories of many of our students have not been included because people are fearful that this incites some other conversation. But what we're doing here is supporting the inquiry of young people because that is oft ignored. Mm -hmm. I understand that inquiry as being the foundation to learning, right? If we cannot ask questions, it becomes impossible for us to learn anything about it, right? So now this thing around putting that forward because they don't really know what CRT is. Right. Right, and aren't really trying to know, right? So now this thing is right, so you don't have to go, you don't have to get directed into the CRT argument, right? You can put it right back to learning. So uh, I had the chance to study race as a subject, right? Most of what you're doing is not 
about studying the subject of race. Race is like the, the context. It's the background. It's, you know, it, it's, it's the thing that grounds the student experience. And so you can foreground the topic that you're trying to teach, right? Um, whether it be, you know, what, are you a social studies teacher? What's, what's your? Elementary. Elementary education, okay. And so elementary kids, you know, need to learn certain topics or subjects uh, in, so, in social science. Uh, they need to learn about how communities are developed, right? Uh, and, how, and how communities work. Uh, they need to learn about, you know, um, governance structures, right? Uh, statewide governance structures, you know, federal. And, and, and you can use all of that as the subject, right? And if you're focusing on and thinking about student experience as a thread through that, then, then race comes out, but race is not the, the, the topic, right? Um, the, the topic is, is community. The top is, is gov topic is governance structures. Uh, and student experiences around race um, matter because that's, that's what students are concerned about and interested in. And you connect that as a thread through the literature. So, you know, I think um, that's, that's one way to think about doing it. Um, and, and, and again, I, I don't agree. You know, when people, when teachers go in classrooms and say, this is racist or that's racist, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Because mm -hmm. what I want you to do is give students information about what happened, about the history, about the, the context, and then let them make th their own decisions about that. If, you know, they, they may determine, yeah, that was absolutely racist. Um, but so, so I would avoid, you know, those kinds of uh, statements uh, in the classroom um, about the history. I mean, the history is what it is, right? And teach it accurately and correctly, and then let the students decide how, how to think about it. And then I, um, like this year for me, it was pretty interesting because when Black History Month came, we had students, white, black, whatever, it was like, well, can Mr. Strader, why are we learning about um, Mexicans and Indians on in history in this Black History Month? I said, I don't know. I'm not a history teacher. I don't know. And then I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start teaching some history. And I said, well, when I was young, uh, your age, uh, blacks only hung with blacks. Whites were with whites. Mexicans were with Mexicans. But what I love about Gen Z and millennial generation you guys mess with everything, blacks, whites, Mexicans, Asians, I love it. I said, you guys are gonna break this American cycle because you're with each other and you're loving each other and you look outside of color. And I said, and that's what makes you guys great. And then I'll, I'll say, but you know what? Let me show you guys what was going on back in the 60s with my mother and this and that. And then I'll push play. And then I end it and I say, now what you guys wanna live like that? No, uh-uh, no, we couldn't do that. And so I just have a different way of, of, you know, teaching them and relating to them like that because it's real out here with them. They're, they're very diverse. This generation is the most diverse generation we ever had in history, you know, so. Thank you for those insights. Another question from the audience. I have a comment. Yes, uh, Borna in the front. sort of a comment, but also I'd like to bounce off of you. Um, so obviously in special education, asset-based is like our whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, how many of you guys have heard the Rita Pearson TED Talk, Every Kid Needs a Champion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of our teachers make us watch that. But Rita Pearson says, you know, she has a kid who doesn't, is, just can't do the schoolwork. He gets two right out of a test. She puts a plus two. You know, and I feel like I have kids in my class who are in first grade, all their peers are reading, and it breaks my heart when one of them says, Miss Unicorn, I can't read. Oh, I'm sorry, they call me Miss Unicorn. <laughs> um, I can't read. And I said, well, I think you can. So let's see, let's try it. And we decode like one phoneme at a time, and then they feel like, oh, maybe I can do this, and maybe I can do my work in my general education classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really easy for us as educators, especially in a general education classroom with so many kids, especially in CCSD, to just be doing like a robot, mm -hmm. like grade the test, percentage of the test. Mm -hmm. But these kids are individuals and we need to see them as individuals and we need to look uh, and make relationships with them 
to find out what their assets are. I interview all my kids, even though they're really young, just to find out that type of stuff. And I feel like, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but like the asset-based approach is the student-centered teaching. Right. It's like the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. And even when the administrators are worried about your SBACs or whatever, that we should be making that the foundation of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent observation. You have a, I just yeah. wanted to touch bases. Uh, <clears throat> as a kid growing up, uh, being in the urban community and being in the stricken areas, these urban kids are going in, they, they forgot about making education fun. You know, like you had go up on the chalkboard and the whole class participated in that. Get mm -hmm. back to that. Get back to making the kids participate in the class, not just read page 255 and right. we're gonna have a test on it next week. You know, after school programs, I look forward to that after school programs. I played ball with Anthony Hardaway. I met him at Boys Club, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Stuff like that. We don't, we don't have any different things going on in the school system to allow the urban and the Mexicans and the whites and the different to relate because we don't, we're not getting the, uh, I, say, I, I guess we say the, the participation of the school, of the students in the class environment. Mm -hmm. So if you teachers get back to that, then mostly most of these kids won't be as jacked up as they are thinking that they can't make it. Like the young lady said, I didn't think I was going to be here today because I thought it was a waste of time. Me, I'm here for this guy today for his, you know, videography. And I learned some stuff myself. You know what I'm saying? I didn't think I was going to learn anything today, but <laughs> being around a bunch of educators and philosophers, get back to that. Be real with your students. Hey, I'm, I've been, I've been a drug dealer. I've been, you know, nothing wrong with smoking weed, nothing, nothing like, like that. You know what I'm saying? So just be real with your students and you're going to get that feedback. You're going to get that, what you guys are looking forward to. Give them that extra, you know, that extra push, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, don't always be quick to judge them. Just, you know, give them that hands-on experience and that way you'll get a, a different uh, feedback from your students. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and you've heard me say this in other professional development days. I think a common theme is transparency. Mm -hmm. Your students yeah. want to hear your yep. narrative, your background. Yep. Yes. Um, and that's clear. And that's regardless of age group, uh, content area, they want to hear not just your successes, but also your challenges, your mm -hmm. barriers. Yeah. Um, and what got you to where you're at today. That right there can inspire your students more probably than anything else. Mm -hmm. When we talk about discussing these various different lives, histories that are silenced, that's the first step. Because at the foundation of education is about building rapport. And we know that particularly for students of color and low resource students, that rapport is significantly important. So thank you for sharing that. I just, can I respond? Oh, yes, he, yes. he mentioned something too about sports and kids having an opportunity to be, to be, to move. And as an, you know, I've taught elementary and for those of you who are elementary teachers, you know that you have to create opportunities during the day for kids to move. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you have to integrate that into your instruction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have to integrate not only movement, but interaction between yep. students, yep. right? And opportunities for collaboration. So you were, you were speaking to some very basic ideas around you know just good teaching that's around and but and connecting again to to your life but also to the students lives my question is more for how because i'm i'm in my first grade student teaching so i'll be graduating in may and i'm in a middle class school to where we have a handful of students that are just they don't come to school and my more concern is how do i reach out to the parents to help them break down Yes, your schooling back in the day might not have been as good, and I want to break that cycle to get them to come to school. And I know for one, there is no mom in the picture, and it's dad and grandma. And she just comes in, and she is on the path for retention because of her absences. Mm -hmm. And she, I don't know how she skipped kindergarten completely and is in first grade. And she's lacking a lot of those fundamental. How do you reach out, or what are your suggestions for us as educators to like reach the parents who also need to be included in this conversation? Community resources. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Oh, that was me. <laughs> yeah, I would say the first thing is, um, well, first reach out to your admin. Of course, I'm sure your admin already knows this, but I, I think what it boils down to is the resources, right? Um, we don't know what go is going on in our household. Um, they might not have the the lights might not be on. You know what I mean? And I say that because my little sister is a high school teacher over at Bonanza, and she faced like when I tell you her students go through the most, and it's like her and her um, department, they're literally always. Um, raising money for their students and their families for gift cards to get a shoe, you know, to pay bills mm -hmm. for the, you know, for mm -hmm. their parents and the family. So I would say most folks need access and resources. You know, like a conversation probably isn't going to change the student being able to get back and forth to school, right? Um, so really just making a real, not saying that's not a real impact because you caring is taking the first step, you know what I mean? But figuring out how y'all can really help them, you know what I mean? And to not frame it as a bad family. Yes. Right? Because that that's that's often that's where the deficit stuff emanates from, mm -hmm. right? Right. You, mm -hmm. you when we don't understand the situations, we go to innuendo, right? So now when you say, look, the most important thing is being able to support, you know, in your conversation with the family, is to be able to support you all as families and to support what we're trying to do for your daughter. That you let us you let us know what is needed, and we are accountable to make sure that we can right. do all we humanly can to make sure that happens, right? Because one of the things, especially when you talk about, you know, you all have a Clark County Department of Human Services or uh, which has a child and family services division in it, right? And those spaces are not as resourceful as they are violent and surveillance connected, mm -hmm. right? So those spots, so when they come, you know, when you, are, when you are situating yourself with that grouping of people, now the association is to you with that same type of violence, mm. yeah. right? So now you have, to think, you have to think about what is a humanizing approach with folks mm. and saying, look, the most important thing I can do today is have this conversation with you about what you feel is needed, and now I can talk about what's available, and I need you to hold me to account to make sure that I do the say that I do the things that I have discussed with you. Here's the best way to contact me. Here, here's what I'm doing in the space, and I believe in your I believe in the capacity of your daughter to do all the things that she's trying to do. The only thing I, I'm trying to do is figure out the best way to support her, mm -hmm. right? And that thing around when you, when you do that, it takes away from. Your daughter has 15 absences. If she gets another, if she gets another five, she's going to be retained. Mm. I mean, that that's that's the easiest way to cut off the conversation. Yeah. So now you have to think about what are the ways that you are coming to that door with resources, and how do you now set up a constant line of, a com of communication between you and them, right? Right, Because it's not around just the referral. It's literally around, if I have had this conversation with you, then I need to keep in tune with you, yeah. right? right, for the follow-up. So the follow-up, and again, I've said this in the, uh, both groupings, the follow-up is even more important than the initial conversation. Mm -hmm. Right, because that demonstrates accountability. Mm -hmm. Right, so now when you are engaging in that way, a family is much more in tune to talk about what the real situation is. Right, and that's a, and you know, you also, and I'm glad you mentioned the type of school that you're in, because you also got to consider the violence. If that's a, if that's a family that doesn't have a lot of resources, and they're in a space with a family with a, with families with a bunch of resources, that's very inhibiting. Mm -hmm. Right, and that can that can make young folks feel certain ways about themselves. So now they need support in that way to say, "Don't worry about that. We got you on these spaces, and here's what we're going to do." And that takes time, right? It won't happen in the initial conversation. You have to be consistent in that space, right? In terms of what it is that you're going to do, because in too many spaces we get that hostility and violence and surveillance going on, and we're unable to actually get to the issue and concern of supporting that young person. Yeah, I would just add to that that it, it, building that relationship is key. Um, I 
when I was, I taught third grade uh, in, in Chicago, and it was, it was not a poor school, it was a mix, you know, and, and so I did have some, some kids who were better off and some kids who struggled. Uh, and I remember the, a little boy who, who really struggled um, and missed a lot of days of school. And one of the things that I did was I just struck up a relationship with that family. And I just would sometimes call to say, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and not even mention the fact that yep. this happened or that happened, you know, or I'm concerned about this or that, because that that getting that relationship developed gives you the opportunity later on to then you know talk about the concerns. But as he was saying, if you start with the concerns, then it, then it's off putting and people feel attacked. So that relationship and and through that building that relationship, I got to know that family. I got to know about what the mother was dealing with, right? And somehow uh, the partner was sort of staying out of the picture, didn't want to be involved. Um, and through my communication and connection with the partner, uh, because mother was sometimes out of commission, the partner was like, well, how can I help? What can I do? And I was like, well, you could bring him to school, right? <laughs> and so we developed a connection, me and the partner, and we, we partnered to ensure that that kid would be successful. And that kid today is very successful, but was in a situation at the time that could have been pretty uh, uh, damaging. And I think their assumption was that we didn't care. Right. Uh, and through uh, getting, just getting to know those people and, and, and saying, how can I help? Now, there were times too, and I know it's harder to do this today. I, this was in the 90s when I was doing this, so it's different. Um, but you know, there were times when I had to step up and help out because there was something that was needed that they couldn't access, and I had to figure out. Now, I do think the point uh, about social services, uh, you know, my wife is a nurse, and so sometimes, you know, when you have a patient in trouble mm -hmm. who doesn't have food, who doesn't have mm -hmm. money, you know, there are places you can go to, to get mm -hmm. that support for them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think social services can be important in terms of connecting people to getting their basic needs met. And then sometimes you as an educator um, have to also be willing to step up and, and assist uh, families uh, who are struggling with, with basic needs. I, I just want to add one more thing to that. I um, also mentioned the importance in our sessions about um, getting into the community and being a face in the community that you teach in. And that's also that building trust, well, that, um, that aspect of building trust in the community and with your students and with their parents. Um, so that way, and that goes to what um, he's saying, that building trust within that so they are more likely to have that conversation with you because oftentimes when they do go to social services, that is putting the, the people in their business. You know what I mean? And that's taking their kids away ultimately. You know what I mean? And um, so I think the teachers are kind of like that first line defense. So that's why I always encourage folks like I know you're so busy you guys are burnt out uh, oftentimes or most of the time but you know do some community service in a neighborhood that you that you're teaching in you know what I mean like let the people in the community get to know you and who you are so all right thank you everyone uh, please give another round of applause for our uh, panel and our esteemed scholars